story three of a thin ghost and others by montague rhodes james this librivox recording is in the public domain story three an episode of cathedral history there was once a learned gentleman who was deputed to examine and report upon the archive of the cathedral of southminster the examination of these records demanded a very considerable expenditure of time hence it became advisable for him to engage lodgings in the city for though the cathedral body were profuse in their offers of hospitality mr lake felt that he would prefer to be master of his day this was recognized as reasonable the dean eventually wrote advising mr lake if he were not already suited to communicate with mr warby the principal verger who occupied a house convenient to the church and was prepared to take in a quiet lodger for three or four weeks such an arrangement was precisely what mr lake desired terms were easily agreed upon and early in december like another mr datchery as he remarked to himself the investigator found himself in the occupation of a very comfortable room in an ancient and cathedrally house one so familiar with the customs of cathedral churches and treated with such obvious consideration by the dean and chapter of this cathedral in particular could not fail to command the respect of the head verger mr warby even acquiesced in certain modifications of statements he had been accustomed to offer for years to parties of visitors mr lake on his part found the verger a very cheery companion and took advantage of any occasion that presented itself for enjoying his conversation when the day's work was over one evening about nine o'clock mr warby knocked at his lodger's door i've occasion he said to go across to the cathedral mr lake and i think i made your promise when i did so next i would give you the opportunity to see what it looks like at night-time it is quite fine and dry outside if you care to come to be sure i will very much obliged to you mr warby for thinking of it but let me get my coat here it is sir and i've another lantern here that you'll find advisable for the steps as there's no moon any one might think we were jasper and Durdles over again mightn't they said lake as they crossed the close for he had ascertained that the verger had read edwin drood well so they might said mr warby with a short laugh though i don't know whether we ought to take it as a compliment odd ways i often think they had at that cathedral don't it seem so to you sir full choral matins at seven o'clock in the morning all the year round wouldn't suit our boys voices nowadays and i think there's one or two of the men would be applying for a rise if the chapter was to bring it in particularly the altos they were now at the southwest corner as mr warby was unlocking it lake said did you ever find anybody locked in here by accident twice i did one was a drunk sailor however he got in i don't know i suppose he went to sleep in the service but by the time i got to him he was praying fit to bring the roof in lor what a noise that man did make said it was the first time he'd been inside a church for ten years and blessed if ever he'd try it again and another was an old sheep them boys it was up to their games that was the last time they tried it on though there sir now you see what we look like our late dean used now and again to bring parties in but he preferred a moonlit night and there was a piece of verse he'd coat to them relating to a scotch cathedral i understand but i don't know i almost think the effect's better when it's all dark like seems to add to the size and height now if you won't mind stopping somewhere in the nave while i go up into the choir where my business lays you'll see what i mean accordingly lake waited leaning against a pillar and watched the light wavering along the length of the church and up the steps into the choir until it was intercepted by some screen or other furniture which only allowed the reflection to be seen on the piers and roof not many minutes had passed before warby reappeared at the door of the choir and by waving his lantern signalled to lake to rejoin him i suppose it is warby and not a substitute thought lake to himself as he walked up the nave there was in fact nothing untoward 
Warby showed him the papers which he had come to fetch out of the dean's stall, and asked him what he thought of the spectacle. Lake agreed that it was well worth seeing. I suppose, he said, as they walked towards the altar steps together, that you're too much used to going about here at night to feel nervous, but you must get a start every now and then, don't you, when a book falls down or a door swings to? No, Mr. Lake, I can't say I think much about noises, not nowadays. I'm much more afraid of finding an escape of gas or a burst in the stovepipes than anything else. Still, there have been times, years ago, did you notice that plain altar tomb there? Fifteenth century, we say it is. I don't know if you agree to that. Well, if you didn't look at it, just come back and give it a glance, if you'd be so good. It was on the north side of the choir, and rather awkwardly placed, only about three feet from the enclosing stone screen. Quite plain, as the verger had said, but for some ordinary stone panelling. A metal cross of some size on the north side, that next to the screen, was the solitary feature of any interest. Lake agreed that it was not earlier than the perpendicular period, but, he said, unless it's the tomb of some remarkable person, you'll forgive me for saying that I don't think it's particularly noteworthy. Well, I can't say it is a tomb of anybody noted in history, said Warby, who had a dry smile on his face, for we don't own any record whatsoever of who it was put up to. For all that, if you've half an hour to spare, sir, when we get back to the house, Mr. Lake, I could tell you a tale about that tomb. I won't begin on it now. It strikes cold here, and we don't want to be dawdling about all night. "'Of course, I should like to hear it immensely.' "'Very well, sir, you shall. Now, if I might put a question to you,' he went on, as they passed down the choir aisle, in our little local guide, and not only there, but in the little book on our cathedral in the series, you'll find it stated that this portion of the building was erected previous to the twelfth century.' Now, of course, I should be glad enough to take that view, but mind the step, sir, but I put it to you, does the lay of the stone ear and this portion of the wall, which he tapped with his key, does it not to your eye carry the flavor of what you might call Saxon masonry? No, I thought not. No more it does to me. Now, if you'll believe me, I've said as much to those men. One's the librarian of our free library here, and the other came down from London on purpose. Fifty times, if I have once, but I might just as well have talked to that bit of stonework. But there it is. I suppose everyone's got their opinion. The discussion of this peculiar trait of human nature occupied Mr. Warby almost up to the moment when he and Lake re-entered the former's house. The condition of the fire in Lake's sitting-room led to a suggestion from Mr. Warby that they should finish the evening in his own parlour. We find them, accordingly, settled there some short time afterwards. Mr. Warby made his story a long one, and I will not undertake to tell it wholly in his own words or in his own order. Lake committed the substance of it to paper immediately after hearing it, together with some few passages of the narrative which had fixed themselves verbatim in his mind. I shall probably find it expedient to condense Lake's record to some extent. Mr. Warby was born, it appeared, about the year 1828. His father before him had been connected with the cathedral, and likewise his grandfather one or both had been choristers and in later life both had done work as mason and carpenter respectively about the fabric warby himself though possessed as he frankly acknowledged of an indifferent voice had been drafted into the choir at about ten years of age it was in eighteen forty that the wave of the gothic revival smote the cathedral of southminster there was a lot of lovely stuff went then sir said warby with a sigh my father couldn't hardly believe it when he got his orders to clear out the choir there was a new dean just come in dean borsco it was and my father had been prenticed to a good firm of joiners in the city and knew what good work was when he saw it cruel it was he used to say all that beautiful wainscot oak as good as the day it was put up and garlands-like of foliage and fruit and lovely old gilding work on the coats of arms and the organ-pipes 
all went to the timber yard every bit except some little pieces worked up in the lady chapel an ear in this overmantel well i may be mistook but i say our choir never looked as well since still there was a lot found out about the history of the church and no doubt but what it did stand in need of repair there were very few winters past but what we'd lose a pinnacle mr lake expressed his concurrence with warby's views of restoration but owns to a fear about this point lest the story proper should never be reached possibly this was perceptible in his manner warby hastened to reassure him not but what i could carry on about that topic for hours at a time and do do when i see my opportunity but dean bursko he was very set on the gothic period and nothing would serve him but everything must be made agreeable to that and one morning after service he appointed for my father to meet him in the choir and he came back after he'd taken off his robes in the vestry and he'd got a roll of paper with him and the verger that was then brought in a table and they begun spreading it out on the table with prayer-books to keep it down and my father helped him and he saw it was a picture of the inside of a choir in a cathedral and the dean he was a quick-spoken gentleman he says well warby what do you think of that why says my father i don't think i have the pleasure of knowing that view would that be airford cathedral mr dean no warby said the dean that southminster cathedral as we hope to see it before many years indeed sir says my father and that was all he did say leastwise to the dean but he used to tell me he felt really faint in himself when he looked round our choir as i can remember it all comfortable and furnished like and then see this nasty little dry picter as he called it drawn out by some london architect well there i am again but you'll see what i mean if you look at this old view warby reached down a framed print from the wall well the long and short of it was that the dean he handed over to my father a copy of an order of the chapter that he was to clear out every bit of the choir make a clean sweep ready for the new work that was being designed up in town and he was to put it in hand as soon as ever he could get the breakers together now then sir if you look at that view you'll see where the pulpit used to stand that's what i want you to notice if you please it was indeed easily seen an unusually large structure of timber with a domed sounding board standing at the east end of the stalls on the north side of the choir facing the bishop's throne warby proceeded to explain that during the alterations services were held in the nave the members of the choir being thereby disappointed of an anticipated holiday and the organist in particular incurring the suspicion of having wilfully damaged the mechanism of the temporary organ that was hired at considerable expense from london the work of demolition began with the choir screen and organ loft and proceeded gradually eastwards disclosing as warby said many interesting features of older work while this was going on the members of the chapter were naturally in and about the choir a great deal and it soon became apparent to the elder warby who could not help overhearing some of their talk that on the part of the senior canons especially there must have been a good deal of disagreement before the policy now being carried out had been adopted some were of opinion that they should catch their deaths of cold in the return stalls unprotected by a screen from the draughts in the nave others objected to being exposed to the view of persons in the choir aisles especially they said during the sermons when they found it helpful to listen in a posture which was liable to misconstruction the strongest opposition however came from the oldest of the body who up to the last moment objected to the removal of the pulpit you ought not to touch it mr dean he said with great emphasis one morning when the two were standing before it you don't know what mischief you may do mischief it's not a work of any particular merit canon don't call me canon said the old man with great asperity that is for thirty years i've been known as dr Eiloff and i would be obliged mr dean if you would kindly humour me in that matter and as to the pulpit which i've preached from for thirty years though i don't insist on that all i'll say is i know you're doing wrong in moving it 
but what sense could there be my dear doctor in leaving it where it is when we're fitting up the rest of the choir in a totally different style what reason could be given apart from the look of the thing reason reason said old dr ayloff if you young men if i may say so without any disrespect mr dean if you'd only listen to reason a little and not be always asking for it we should get on better but there i've said my say the old gentleman hobbled off and as it proved never entered the cathedral again the season it was a hot summer turned sickly on a sudden dr ayloff was one of the first to go with some affection of the muscles of the thorax which took him painfully at night and at many services the number of choirmen and boys was very thin meanwhile the pulpit had been done away with in fact the sounding-board part of which still exists as a table in a summer-house in the palace garden was taken down within an hour or two of dr ayloff's protest the removal of the base not effected without considerable trouble disclosed to view greatly to the exultation of the restoring party an altar tomb the tomb of course to which warby had attracted lake's attention that same evening much fruitless research was expended in attempts to identify the occupant from that day to this he has never had a name put to him the structure had been most carefully boxed in under the pulpit base so that such slight ornament as it possessed was not defaced only on the north side of it there was what looked like an injury a gap between two of the slabs composing the side it might be two or three inches across palmer the mason was directed to fill it up in a week's time when he came to do some other small jobs near that part of the choir the season was undoubtedly a very trying one whether the church was built on a site that had once been a marsh as was suggested or for whatever reason the residents in its immediate neighbourhood had many of them but little enjoyment of the exquisite sunny days and the calm nights of august and september to several of the older people dr ayloff among others as we have seen the summer proved downright fatal but even among the younger few escaped either a sojourn in bed for a matter of weeks or at the least a brooding sense of oppression accompanied by hateful nightmares gradually there formulated itself a suspicion which grew into a conviction that the alterations in the cathedral had something to say in the matter the widow of a former old verger a pensioner of the chapter of southminster was visited by dreams which she retailed to her friends of a shape that slipped out of the little door of the south transept as the dark fell in and flitted taking a fresh direction every night about the close disappearing for a while in house after house and finally emerging again when the night sky was paling she could see nothing of it she said but that it was a moving form only she had an impression that when it returned to the church as it seemed to do in the end of the dream it turned its head and then she could not tell why but she thought it had red eyes warby remembered hearing the old lady tell this dream at a tea-party in the house of the chapter clerk its recurrence might perhaps he said be taken as a symptom of approaching illness at any rate before the end of september the old lady was in her grave the interest excited by the restoration of this great church was not confined to its own county one day that summer an f s a of some celebrity visited the place his business was to write an account of the discoveries that had been made for the society of antiquaries and his wife who accompanied him was to make a series of illustrative drawings for his report in the morning she employed herself in making a general sketch of the choir in the afternoon she devoted herself to details she first drew the newly exposed altar tomb and when that was finished she called her husband's attention to a beautiful piece of diaper ornament on the screen just behind it which had like the tomb itself been completely concealed by the pulpit of course he said an illustration of that must be made so she seated herself on the tomb and began a careful drawing which occupied her till dusk 
her husband had by this time finished his work of measuring and description and they agreed that it was time to be getting back to their hotel you may as well brush my skirt frank said the lady it must have got covered with dust i'm sure he obeyed dutifully but after a moment he said don't know whether you value this dress particularly my dear but i'm inclined to think it's seen its best days there's a great bit of it gone gone where said she i don't know where it's gone but it's off at the bottom edge behind here she pulled it hastily into sight and was horrified to find a jagged tear extending some way into the substance of the stuff very much she said as if a dog had rent it away the dress was in any case hopelessly spoilt to her great vexation and though they looked everywhere the missing piece could not be found there were many ways they concluded in which the injury might have come about for the choir was full of old bits of woodwork with nails sticking out of them finally they could only suppose that one of these had caused the mischief and that the workmen who had been about all day had carried off the particular piece with the fragment of dress still attached to it it was about this time worley thought that his little dog began to wear an anxious expression when the hour for it to be put into the shed in the back yard approached for his mother had ordained that it must not sleep in the house one evening he said when he was just going to pick it up and carry it out it looked at him like a christian and waved its head as i was going to say well you know how they do carry on sometimes and the end of it was i put it under my coat and huddled it upstairs and i'm afraid i as good as deceived my poor mother on the subject after that the dog acted very artful with hiding itself under the bed for half an hour or more before bedtime came and we worked it so as my mother never found out what we'd done of course warby was glad of its company anyhow but more particularly when the nuisance that is still remembered in southminster as the crying set in night after night said warby that dog seemed to know it was coming he'd creep out he would and snuggle into the bed and cuddle right up to me shivering and when the crying come he'd be like a wild thing shoving his head under my arm and i was fully near as bad six or seven times we'd hear it not more and when he'd draw out his head again i'd know it was over for that night what was it like sir well i never heard but one thing that seemed to hit it off i happened to be playing about in the close and there was two of the cannons met and said good morning one to another sleep well last night says one it was mr henslow that one and mr lyle was the other can't say i did said mr lyle rather too much of isaiah thirty four fourteen for me thirty four fourteen says mr henslow what's that you call yourself a bible reader says mr lyle mr henslow you must know he was one of what used to be termed simeon's lot pretty much what we would call the evangelical party you go and look it up i wanted to know what he was getting at myself and so off i ran home and got out my own bible and there it was the satyr shall cry to his fellow well i thought is that what we've been listening to these past nights and i tell you it made me look over my shoulder a time or two of course i'd asked my father and mother about what it could be before that but they both said it was most likely cats but they spoke very short and i could see they was troubled my word that was a noise hungry like as if it was calling after someone that wouldn't come if ever you felt you wanted company it would be when you was waiting for it to begin again i believe two or three nights there was men put on to watch in different parts of the close but they all used to get together in one corner the nearest they could to the high street and nothing came of it well the next thing was this me and another of the boys he's in business in the city now as a grocer like his father before him we'd gone up in the close after morning service was over and we heard old palmer the mason bellowing to some of his men so we went up nearer because we knew he was a rusty old chap and there might be some fun going it appears palmer had told his men to stop up the chinks in that old tomb 
well there was this old man keeping on saying he'd done it the best he could and there was palmer carrying on like all possessed about it call that making a job of it he says if you had your rights you'd get the sack for this what do you suppose i pay you your wages for what do you suppose i'm going to say to the dean and chapter when they come around as come they may do any time and see where you've been bungling about covering the old place with mess and plaster and lord knows what well master i done the best i could says the man i don't know no more than what you do how it come to fall out this way i tamped it right in a hole he says and now it's fell out he says i never see fell out says old palmer why it's nowhere near the place blowed out you mean and he picked up a piece of plaster and so did i that was laying up against the screen three or four feet off and not dry yet and old palmer he looked at it curious like and then he turned round to me and he says now then you boys have you been up to some of your games here no i says i haven't mr palmer there's none of us been about here till just this minute and while i was talking the other boy evans he got looking in through the chink and i heard him draw in his breath and he came away sharp and up to us and says he i believe there's something in there i saw something shiny what i dare say says old palmer well i ain't got time to stop about there you william you go off and get some more stuff and make a job of it this time if not there'll be trouble in my yard he says so the man went off and palmer too and us boys stopped behind and i says to evans did you really see something in there yes he says i did indeed so then i says let's shove something in and stir it up and we tried several of the bits of wood that was laying about but they were all too big then evans he had a sheet of music he brought with him an anthem or a service i forget which it was now and he rolled it up small and shoved it in the chink two or three times he did it and nothing happened give it me boy i said and i had a try no nothing happened then i don't know why i thought of it i'm sure but i stooped down just opposite the chink and put my two fingers in my mouth and whistled you know the way and at that i seemed to think i heard something stirring and i says to evans come away i says i don't like this oh rot he says give me that roll and he took it and shoved it in and i don't think ever i see any one go so pale as he did i say warby he says it's caught or some one's got hold of it pull it out or leave it i says come and let's get off so he gave a good pull and it came away leastways most of it did but the end was gone torn off it was and evans looked at it for a second and then he gave a sort of croak and let it drop and we both made off out of there as quick as ever we could when we got outside evans says to me did you see the end of that paper no i says only it was torn yes it was he says but it was wet too and black well partly because of the fright we had and partly because that music was wanted in a day or two and we knew there'd be a set out about it with the organist we didn't say nothing to any one else and i suppose the workmen they swept up the bit that was left along with the rest of the rubbish but evans if you were to ask him this very day about it he'd stick to it he saw that paper wet and black at the end where it was torn after that the boys gave the choir a wide berth so that warby was not sure what was the result of the mason's renewed mending of the tomb only he made out from fragments of conversation dropped by the workmen passing through the choir that some difficulty had been met with and that the governor mr palmer to wit had tried his own hand at the job a little later he happened to see mr palmer himself knocking at the door of the deanery and being admitted by the butler a day or so after that he gathered from a remark his father let fall at breakfast that something a little out of the common was to be done in the cathedral after morning service on the morrow and i just as soon it was to-day his father added i don't see the use of running risks father i says what are you going to do in the cathedral to-morrow and he turned on me as savage as ever i see him 
he was a wonderful good-tempered man as a general thing my poor father was my lad he said i'll trouble you not to go picking up your elders and betters talk it's not manners and it's not straight what i'm going to do or not going to do in the cathedral to-morrow is none of your business and if i catch sight of you hanging about the place to-morrow after your work's done i'll send you home with a flea in your ear now you mind that of course i said i was very sorry and that and equally of course i went off and laid my plans with evans we knew there was a stair up in the corner of the transept which you can get up to the triforium and in them days the door to it was pretty well always open and even if it wasn't we knew the key usually laid under a bit of matting hard by so we made up our minds we'd be putting away music and that next morning while the rest of the boys was clearing off and then slip up the stairs and watch from the triforium if there was any signs of work going on well that same night i dropped off asleep as sound as a boy does and all of a sudden the dog woke me up coming into the bed and thought i now we're going to get it sharp for he seemed more frightened than usual after about five minutes sure enough came this cry i can't give you no idea what it was like and so near too nearer than i'd heard it yet and a funny thing mr lake you know what a place this close is for an echo and particular if you stand this side of it well this crying never made no sign of an echo at all but as i said it was dreadful near this night and on the top of the start i got with hearing it i got another fright for i heard something rustling outside in the passage now to be sure i thought i was done but i noticed the dog seemed to perk up a bit and next there was some one whispered outside the door and i very near laughed out loud for i knew it was my father and mother that had got out of bed with the noise whatever is it says my mother hush i don't know says my father excited like don't disturb the boy i hope he didn't hear nothing so me knowing they were just outside it made me bolder and i slipped out of bed across to my little window giving on the close but the dog he bored right down to the bottom of the bed and i looked out first go off i couldn't see anything then right down in the shadow under a buttress i made out what i shall always say was two spots of red a dull red it was nothing like a lamp or a fire but just so as you could pick em out of the black shadow i hadn't but just sighted em when it seemed we wasn't the only people that had been disturbed because i see a window in a house on the left-hand side become lighted up and the light moving i just turned my head to make sure of it and then looked back into the shadow for those two red things and they were gone and for all i peered about and stared there was not a sign more of them then come my last fright that night something come against my bare leg but that was all right that was my little dog had come out of bed and prancing about making a great to-do only holding his tongue and me seeing he was quite in spirits again i took him back to bed and we slept the night out next morning i made out to tell my mother i'd had the dog in my room and i was surprised after all she'd said about it before how quiet she took it did you she asked well by good rights you ought to go without your breakfast for doing such a thing behind my back but i don't know as there's any great harm done only another time you ask my permission do you hear a bit after that i said something to my father about having heard the cats again cats he says and he looked over at my poor mother and she coughed and he says oh yeah, yeah cats i believe i heard him myself that was a funny morning altogether nothing seemed to go right the organist he stopped in bed and the minor canon he forgot it was the nineteenth day and waited for the venite and after a bit the deputy he set off playing the chant for evensong which was a minor and then the decani boys were laughing so much they couldn't sing and when it came to the anthem the solo boy he got took with the giggles and made out his nose was bleeding and shoved the book at me what hadn't practised the verse and wasn't much of a singer if i had known it well things was rougher you see fifty years ago and i got a nip from the counter tenor behind me that i remembered 
so we got through somehow and neither the men nor the boys weren't by way of waiting to see whether the canon in residence mr henslow it was would come to the vestries and fine em but i don't believe he did for one thing i fancy he'd read the wrong lesson for the first time in his life and knew it anyhow evans and me didn't find no difficulty in slipping up the stairs as i told you and when we got up we laid ourselves down flat on our stomachs where we could just stretch our heads out over the old tomb and we hadn't but just done so when we heard the verger that was then first shutting the iron porch gates and locking the southwest door and then the transept door so we knew there was something up and they meant to keep the public out for a bit next thing was the dean and the canon come in by their door on the north and then i see my father and old palmer and a couple of their best men and palmer stood a-talking for a bit with the dean in the middle of the choir he had a coil of rope and the men had crows all of them looked a bit nervous so there they stood talking and at last i heard the dean say well i've no time to waste palmer if you think this'll satisfy southminster people i'll permit it to be done but i must say this that never in the whole course of my life have i heard such arrant nonsense from a practical man as i have from you don't you agree with me henslow as far as i could hear mr henslow said something like oh well we're told aren't we mr dean not to judge others and the dean he gave a kind of sniff and walked straight up to the tomb and took his stand behind it with his back to the screen and the others they come edging up rather gingerly henslow he stopped on the south side and scratched on his chin he did then the dean spoke up palmer he says which can you do easiest get the slab off the top or shift one of the side slabs old palmer and his men they pottered about a bit looking round the edge of the top slab and sounding the sides on the south and east and west and everywhere but the north henslow said something about it being better to have a try at the south side because there was more light and more room to move about in then my father who'd been watching of them went round to the north side and knelt down and felt of the slab by the chink and he got up and dusted his knees and says to the dean beg pardon mr dean but i think if mr palmer'll try this here slab he'll find it'll come out easy enough seems to me one of the men could prize it out with his crow by means of this chink ah thank you warby says the dean that's a good suggestion palmer let one of your men do that will you so the man came round and put his bar in and bore on it and just that minute when they were all bending over and we boys got our heads well out over the edge of the triforium there come a most fearful crash down at the west end of the choir as if a whole stack of big timber had fallen down a flight of stairs well you can't expect me to tell you everything that happened all in a minute of course there was a terrible commotion i heard the slab fall out and the crowbar on the floor and i heard the dean say good god when i looked down again i saw the dean tumbled over on the floor the men was making off down the choir henslow was just going to help the dean up palmer was going to stop the men as he said afterwards and my father was sitting on the altar step with his face in his hands the dean he was very cross i wish to goodness you'd look where you're coming to henslow he says why you should all take to your heels when a stick of wood tumbles down i cannot imagine and all henslow could do explaining he was right away on the other side of the tomb would not satisfy him then palmer came back and reported there was nothing to account for this noise and nothing seemingly fallen down and when the dean finished feeling of himself they gathered round except my father he sat where he was and some one lighted up a bit of candle and they looked into the tomb nothing there says the dean what did i tell you stay here's something what's this a bit of music paper and a piece of torn stuff part of a dress it looks like both quite modern no interest whatever another time perhaps you'll take the advice of an educated man or something like that and off he went limping a bit and out through the north door only as he went he called back angry to palmer for leaving the door standing open 
palmer called out very sorry sir but he shrugged his shoulders and henslaw says i fancy mr dean's mistaken i closed the door behind me but he's a little upset then palmer says why where's warby and they saw him sitting on the step and went up to him he was recovering himself it seemed and wiping his forehead and palmer helped him up on to his legs as i was glad to see they were too far off for me to hear what they said but my father pointed to the north door in the aisle and palmer and henslow both of them looked very surprised and scared after a bit my father and henslow went out of the church and the others made what haste they could to put the slab back and plaster it in and about as the clock struck twelve the cathedral was opened again and us boys made the best of our way home i was in a great taking to know what it was had given my poor father such a turn and when i got in and found him sitting in his chair taking a glass of spirits and my mother standing looking anxious at him i couldn't keep from bursting out and making confession where i'd been but he didn't seem to take on not in the way of losing his temper you was there was you well did you see it i see everything father i said except when the noise came did you see what it was knocked the dean over he says that what came out of that monument you didn't well that's a mercy why what was it father i said come you must have seen it he says didn't you see a thing like a man all over hair and two great eyes to it well that was all i could get out of him that time and later on he seemed as if he was ashamed of being so frightened and he used to put me off when i asked him about it but years after when i was got to be a grown man we had more talk now and again on the matter and he always said the same thing black it was he'd say and a mass of hair and two legs and the light caught on its eyes well that's the tale of that tomb mr lake it's one we won't tell to our visitors and i should be obliged to you not to make any use of it till i'm out of the way i doubt mr evans will feel the same as i do if you ask him this proved to be the case but over twenty years have passed by and the grass is growing over both warby and evans so mr lake felt no difficulty about communicating his notes taken in eighteen ninety to me he accompanied them with a sketch of the tomb and a copy of the short inscription on the metal cross which was affixed at the expense of dr lyle to the centre of the north gate it was from the vulgate of isaiah thirty four and consisted merely of the three words ibi cubavit lamia end of story three